the Spy Typhoon at that day, I still remember. So <laughs> I'm really happy that you, you all get to come to Taipei this time, so that we can have a face-to-face -face conversation. Now, uh, just as in uh, video link, uh, Slido, we still use Slido, but because we're, this is a small room anyway, uh, so you don't have to, but if you would like, you can scan the QR code or uh, go to slido.com and enter 01019. For such a face-to-face -face, uh, closed meeting, I usually prefer that people raise their hand and we just have a conversation together. But on the other hand, there's people who would uh, rather like to compose their questions very carefully, and so this um, still provides an alternative channel for people to have input, uh, even when somebody like me is hogging the microphone. So I guess it's still a, a good auxiliary um, space. And so the structure will be like this. Um, I will start with maybe five to 10 minutes of very brief presentation of what my office, the public digital innovation space in the Taiwanese cabinet do, uh, and as well as quite a few, maybe two or three uh, digital innovations work that we've been uh, working on. Uh, but during this uh, uh, very like 10 minutes talk, uh, I would uh, encourage you to just start thinking about questions or just start posting those questions online uh, on the Slido platform so that when I switch back to the Slido platform, we can just start talking about anything that people would like uh, to, to talk about. And again, please feel free to just you know interrupt me at any given time. So without further ado, uh, let's begin the, the introduction. So, um, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, um, president of Taiwan, um, said a very inspiring line in her inauguration speech. She said, before, when we think of democracy, we think of a position between two opposing values. But now, as thinking about democracy, we must create a space for conversation between diverse values. Indeed, creating space for diverse values has been the focus of the digital space uh, in Taiwan, so that um, we can respond to the new social development uh, without over relying on the old hierarchical way to respond to them, which is frankly to speaking too slow. Um, the, this is the, the old bad days uh, before the invention of this important technology called hashtag. So I'll just erase it. Uh, so before hashtags, um, people often think of liberal democracies as essentially uh, organizers like party leaders. Uh, perhaps one party would speak for economic development, another would speak for environmental sustainability, or one would speak for technological innovation, and the other would speak for social justice, and so on. Uh, but during those um, different political factions, uh, the career public service is the road in between that remains anonymous, absorb all the risk, uh, and uh, very much working on not breaking, uh, so that the society can still uh, keep each other um, you know, um, trusted and uh, just hang around and uh, co-develop some solutions that are good trade-offs between those competing interests. However, uh, with the advent of mobile computing and most importantly, hashtags, um, this metaphor is uh, very quickly outdated. The idea of hashtags is that people don't need a organizer, a, a party leader, an organizational leader, a member of the parliament, a council member, a minister uh, to start working together. So coordination that used to take uh, a lot of time uh, for hierarchical uh, supports uh, now can get horizontal support in no time through crowdfunding and crowdsourcing and indeed hashtag me too, hashtag climate strike, <coughs> hashtag occupy parliament and so on uh, all became just movement that can mobilize half a million people or more uh, on the street and many more online so that uh, the society would then uh, return to those agenda setters much uh, quicker than the traditional representative democracy do, which relies on maybe five bits of information uploaded every four years, which is called voting. And so the idea is that uh, in new ages democracy, we're now working on ways, instead of asking who are the representatives every four years and who are the representatives uh, trade-offs, and that's still important. We're also focusing on the day-to-day -day work so that people can at any time come to us and with emerging topics without having to wait a quarter, a year, or four years. And so this is literally my office, which is actually quite close to here, so I encourage you to have a visit, uh, or maybe you already had a visit. Uh, and this is the Social Innovation Lab. Um, my three working condition entering the cabinet is location independence. So wherever I'm working, I'm working. So that's my favorite working space. Uh, 
<laughs> and radical transparency, <laughs> meaning that anyone can come and visit me and talk for 40 minutes at a time. Every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., everybody can talk to me. Uh, but my only ask is that whatever we have talked about, uh, we will have to publish to the internet. So to date, after being uh, the digital minister for three years, um, you can see that I've uh, hosted 1,000 meetings, met with 4,500 people, and talked um, to 100,000 uh, or so different speeches. And this is not just summary of the meetings, but rather a very comprehensive uh, lines and uh, indeed the, the developing arguments. And the recent one was the visit by the Center for American Progress. Um, and then people can very quickly see what are their interests are, what questions I have answered, and each one can be quoted within context. And so the, the great thing about this radical transparency is that people don't have to uh, fight uh, in the same room. They can come to me separately, but instead of lobbying for their private interests, which is what would happen without radical transparency, they would have to instead argue for public interest because it's going to be transparent. Uh, and so through this uh, new Way of mechanism design, we make sure that people of different positions in society gradually come to common values. So I'll use one example. Um, a year and a half ago, uh, a few people from the MIT Media Lab came to me in my office hour. So not just human beings came, but also robots. Robots came to my <laughs> office hour. And uh, they, they were like, hey, these are the newest self-driving vehicles, and they're kind of unstable. We're still testing it, and would you like to give it a try? I'm like, what? <laughs> and they're like, um, no, this is very slow. So even their self driving vehicles, they're actually slower than a person running uh, in full speed. And so it's very safe. Even if you run into buildings, it will not harm you. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so I hop on one, and indeed, uh, I did not get harmed. Uh, and so um, I learned that their idea is to use what we call a um, persuasive electric vehicle, or a PEV, to explore the way of what we call co-governance. The idea of co-governance means that the technologists, instead of setting a particular direction for technology to interact in the society, we're asking the society of social innovators to respond to the potential uses of the technology without asking any permissions uh, of the original inventors because they relinquish the copyright and trademarks and patents. This is the idea of open innovation uh, through open source, open hardware, and open data. And so we just literally put a hackathon there and put the self-driving tricycles there and invited people who come by uh, to think of novel and innovative uses of them. And because it's an open lab, right, and it's near the Jianguo flower market, so we have um, the elderly people who just bought some um, orchid flowers or pasta flowers, uh, and they just uh, went by. And after they saw this uh, shopping carts, they said, what are you doing with those shopping carts? And we're trying to explain these are tricycles, these are not shopping carts, uh, but because they have carried flowers on their uh, arms. They were like, no, this is a shopping cart. I would like to use it as a shopping cart. I'm like, okay, sure. Uh, so what would you like uh, to see from this shopping cart now that you learned that it's self-driving? And they're like, oh, I would like it to follow me around when I shop in the uh, Jingwo flower market. When I put into it and it's almost full, I don't have to go back and get another shopping cart. Uh, I would like the self-driving uh, shopping cart to join it into a fleet. Uh, and once it forms a fleet, uh, once I'm done buying the flowers, I would like to hop on one, and I hope it can drive me home, and so on. And so this is something that's totally out of the original scope of the MIT Media Lab invention, uh, and they were forced to respond to the social need, because if you're going to use it as a shopping cart, uh, you have to communicate with everybody in a very crowded jungle flower market so that they know where the shopping cart is headed and who are they interacting with. And so it has to have two eyes, not just one eye. It has to understand people's nonverbal gestures and so on. It has to emote with people. So this is the idea of co-domestication uh, because people would like it to act as a shopping cart. What what an intelligent shopping cart would do is then co-evolved with the society. And so this is what we call a norm first design. We first ask the society, what would you like to be considered the new normal after this technology enter in, into your work? And using the norms, the market respond, as I said, was changing this one eye into two eyes and so on, and say open market, everybody can introduce new components, and then that sets the perimeters of the uh, algorithm of the digital technology so that they understand that in Taiwan, it's very important to first yield to the elderly people, and then um, handicapped people, and then pregnant women, and then maybe children, whereas in the MIT Media Lab, it's the other way around. <laughs> they have to yield to the children. 
structure and nobody really care about the elderly. And so basically every different social configuration has its different social norms. If we ignore the norms and start with the code that determine the law that then colonize the social norm, then a lot of conflict would happen because it's a different cultural expectations. But if we start with the cultural norms, then everybody learns something after a year or so of sandbox experiment in the market that determines the code and that informs the law. The law only affirms, the policy only affirms what the society already learned as a good idea. So this kind of co-governance or co-creation is at the root of our uh, new way of building effective partnerships, which conveniently has a SDG numbering, it's called 1717, encouraging effective partnerships. So um, that's the first part of my talk. I'm really happy that there's already a slide up, um, because otherwise I, I really don't have more slides. Uh, so, okay. right. So, um, uh, a anonymous person, and uh, may I remind you, you can like each other's questions. So the question with the most number of likes will follow to the top. Uh, would, would I explain a little bit more about radical transparency, for sure. So the idea of radical transparency is transparency at the root, meaning that in the Taiwan uh, Freedom of Information Act, and I'm sure worldwide in your country as well, uh, the FOIA basically said anything that government makes as a decision must be open to the public. However, in the drafting stage, when we're still brainstorming about ideas, these are not open by default, unless the uh, chair considers that it is good for the public benefit to publish it. And uh, the chair's superiors must also approve this whole process. And the idea of drafting stage transparency is by far not the norm uh, three years ago when I entered the cabinet to work with the government, not for the government, with the government. And uh, But because I made it my uh, negotiation uh, with my uh, premier, Lin Chen, at the time, and I'm like, so all the meetings that I chair, I consider it for public benefit to publish the entire transcript. So I don't have to ask for approval again. I'm like, so anything that you designate me as a chair, I implicitly say to everybody uh, at the very beginning of the meeting that we will make a transcript. And after 10 working days of co-editing, we will publish whatever that's uh, remained uh, after the co-editing uh, to the public. And so this is transparency at the root, but this is not a violent uh, like live stream because uh, if you have a uh, two-dimensional camera that does the live streaming, the entire power rests in the person holding that camera because they can use framing effect right, to, to just portray the part that they want to portray and they remain hidden from the camera. And so uh, what we are doing essentially is a uh, staged uh, open. The transparent um, transcript is only uh, sent to the public after each participant have reviewed it. And so during many meetings, there's some in-jokes or people slice an anecdotal uh, thing about their friend, but their friend did actually not authorize them to make that into the public record. All those could be removed from the transcript, uh, and then we publish the result. So basically, this is not saying that everything needs to be uh, live streamed. This is rather saying uh, we're making transparency the default, and it would take extra effort, uh, some editing, to make part of it not transparent. Compared to the old way of FOIA, which is everything is non-transparent, it takes extra effort to make it transparent. And so flipping the default is really what I radical transparency is doing. And why is this important? Because for the Korea Public Service, this changes their payoff matrix in the sense of um, mechanism design. Uh, so this is uh, my other office hour. Um, the office hour that every Wednesday is people traveling to Taipei, but there are also uh, places that are not covered by the high-speed rails, and which is a hot topic uh, in the recent days. But in any case, uh, as, as the high-speed rails extend its scope, of course, more and more people can visit me in Taipei with just under two hours of travel, but there's also parts in Taiwan, the rural parts, the mountainous parts, indigenous parts, offshore islands, uh, which is the topic of our next uh, speaker. Uh, they cannot actually very easily travel to Taipei. And so because of that, I go to them. Uh, instead of asking them to come to Social Innovation Lab, we bring a portable Social Innovation Lab to the local people. And so I just meet with them where they are. 
and they may be um, gathered through this, um, you know, non-for-profits, charities, such entrepreneurs, cooperatives uh, locally. Maybe they already have a kind of monthly meeting of sorts, town hall or the elderly meeting of the indigenous nations and so on. And I just go there, um, maybe on Sunday, maybe on Monday, and do a ethnographic, well, just hanging out, hang out them uh, for, for two days. Uh, and then I understand the local context. And then I just... Uh, join their meetings and uh, help facilitating their ideas. But when they're uh, brainstorming about how to make the regional revitalization better, we actually use high-speed bandwidth because we have uh, broadband as human right. So we always have a like ping dong type, a like uh, stable link uh, to the social innovation lab, so that the twelve ministries in charge of this thing is uh, meeting with the people, and they're all section chief or higher level usually. And so instead of the Ministry of Education say, oh. This this is a good idea, but I have to copy the Ministry of Interior. Uh, the Ministry of Interior say, oh, I have, have to copy the Ministry of Economy and so on. Uh, each copy, by the way, is a, what we in information science call a lossy copy. Uh, the whole context becomes so condensed that all we have is like two pages of Word document or a five page of uh, PowerPoint so that people in the central government often think that uh, we've solved the problem structurally, but actually we've just narrowly missed the original story and therefore the solution isn't quite working, but we will only be notified quarter or a year later. But in this radically transparent way, uh, people can not only follow through on the previous transcript, but also the Ministry of Education can just say, you know, instead of copying the Ministry of Health and Welfare, the MOHW is just sitting next to them. So they will just start brainstorming in a very safe way, because even if the local people are unhappy about their presentations or their innovations or their solutions, well, you can't punch anyone over the internet. Um, and so <laughs> it's, they remain in a safe distance so that they can uh, start brainstorming with ease. And before, if they brainstorm something very innovative, it's very rare that the career public service gets the credit. Usually their minister gets the credit, uh, or the premier gets the credit. However, if things go wrong, they get the blame, because the minister can always say, the public public service did not deliver it well, <laughs> and so on. And so it's a kind of loose loose game for the career public service. And our new mechanism designed through radical transparency is to flip this around. As I said, if they delivered an innovative solution, people trust them, and, and you have met them uh, well through the video link. In Taiwan, we say meeting someone face-to-face -face builds 30% of trust, but uh, through high-speed video link, maybe 20% of trust. But it means that the government shows trust to the local people to send the agenda. The local people would then see that the career public service is actually very innovative, and so they build rapport between the two sides, so they get a credit. And if they don't actually have a good idea, or if the idea um, ends up not working well, well, I'm the only one in that vicinity. I absorb all the risk. And so because uh, I absorb the risk and they get the credit, and usually in those social innovation meetings, uh, it's actually very easy for the public service to come up with innovative solutions. And if they need extra budget, extra regulatory, extra personnel support, we also have a structural way of ensuring this, and it's called a presidential hackathon. But radical transparency provides this uh, regional map in Taiwan that everybody can see in si.taiwan, socialinnovation.taiwan, so that people understand what are the current challenges uh, that the Taiwan is facing, what are the people making the proposals, what are our regional touring meetings and their suggestions, and what are the um, different focus uh, as evidenced by the voluntary local reports by the municipalities as well as their local entrepreneurs uh, working on solving the social environmental issues and all of this is indexed by the Sustainable Development Goals. And so this is a new digital lab platform for horizontal leadership across different organization types to solve the common issues and all of this is based on the idea of radical transparency. So I hope that's a long enough answer so that we can have more interesting questions. Uh, but feel free to raise your hand any given time. So um, one person would like to know what have Taiwan government done to handle this information problem? So actually at the root, having the opportunity of meeting me for 40 minutes at a time every week is actually a really good solution to this information. If you have a friend that you just go out to movies or play some basketball or whatever every week, if you hear about that person and as a rumor or gossip or whatever, your first instinct would not be sharing it to other people, but rather checking with them the next time you meet. But if your uh, friend only meets you every quarter and always speak in just very Baroque Latin uh, language, nothing against Latin, but basically in an ancient language, 
language that very few people understand, uh, then basically that makes it impossible for this kind of real-time interaction to happen. And once you lose this real-time interaction, then people would tend to understand that, oh, maybe there's more uh, information sources that are much more um, timely, but they're also sensational and also divisive. And so people would much likely to believe in the disinformation if there is no way for this kind of radically transparent real-time interactions. But fortunately, in Taiwan, uh, we have totally embraced uh, this idea of digital accountability. So, for example, in line today, which is Taiwan's um, leading face-to-face, -face, uh, sorry, end-to-end uh, -end <laughs> encrypted, uh, it's also face-to-face -face, though, it's a video conferencing platform as well. But in any case, if you look at the, the line today, there are um, actually two sections. The first one is the top headlines, right? But the second one is disinformation clarification. And so that means that our um, mimetic output, the from the Taiwan Fact Checking Center, from rumors and truth, from the administration and so on, is um, interesting enough uh, on itself as a content uh, for the Line Today uh, platform to spread to people. And so the basic idea here is that instead of taking anything down, because if you take down, then you get more disinformation about why it's censored by the government, and it actually sometimes just helps the propagation of disinformation. We have a really good um, idea of just coming out, uh, coming up with a real-time clarification within 60 minutes. And a 60 minutes uh, clarification is always um, funny. <laughs> Seeing people laughing, just looking at that one because it's obviously registered. <laughs> the the idea is that people can flag anything as disinformation on the uh, line system. You just long press it, just like flagging something as spam. And for the most trending rumors, the international fact checking network, including its Taiwan chapter, the Taiwan Fact Check Center, will just start investigating. And it's our job as ministries to come up with real time clarifications within sixty minutes for the international fact checkers to work with. And they must be really funny. Uh, so there's a lot of mimetic engineering that goes into the manufacturing of this message. The idea, very simply put, is that the title need to be less than 20 characters. So it's very like, um, you just see, perm your hair will be subject to a $1 million fine. That's not true. And then the, the body, the payload, must be less than 200 characters. So you see our premier, uh, but a photo when he was young, saying, I may be bald now, but I would not punish people who look like my youth, Premier Su. Uh, and a fine print says, what actually transpired is a labeling requirement for hair products that only takes effect two, li two years later. So that's the clarification. But the pneumatic engineering enters because we said each uh, message must fit a um, you know phone screen, but it has to have two images. So what's the second image? Is the premier as he looks now, saying that, however, if you keep perming your hair many times uh, within a week, you will not be fined, but you will damage your hair. And as, uh, when serious, you will end up looking like me now. And so this is a good humor because he makes fun of himself not of any other particular person. This makes sense, even if you haven't seen the disinformation before. This is genuinely funny for Line Today to syndicate and other news outlets to syndicate. And we have numbers to prove that for people who have seen this card, they will not actually share the disinformation when the disinformation reaches them. So this is a good vaccination. This is a good inoculation against disinformation by making those clarification messages standalone and genuinely funny. Uh, people would then have a much better context of policy making instead of just relying on the taking down of messages which always creates um, new conflicts as well as new uh, rooms for the disinformation to grow. So that's a very quick um, overview of our uh, efforts against disinformation. So um, the other question is do I think radical transparency can also be applied to other government agencies in Taiwan as a digital ministry? Yes. So uh, we have seen that in many uh, what we call participatory uh, meetings, open collaboration meetings, often in response to people's petitions, uh, this kind of radical transparency is very, very useful because it enables people to have a lot more context. And this is even more useful if the government genuinely don't know what to do. Um, so for example, just a, a quick example um, is two years ago, there's 
somebody um, in our national petition platform uh, raising a petition. Uh, I haven't translated this one. So it's in his original words, our text filing experience is explosively hostile to users. Um, and uh, the payload is even more toxic, so I will save you uh, from those toxicity. But uh, a lot of people in the petition just started making personal attacks on the Minister of Finance calling for his resignation uh, and saying that the vendor uh, may be corrupt or whatever. Uh, and they would not uh, listen to the very rational explanation of it's actually you know just for non-Windows systems. And it's because Oracle Corporation have discontinued the use of Java, Applet, and so on. These are just technical explanations that nobody really um, understand or indeed care. Uh, and people just say, you know, it's explosively hostile to use. And so the idea of radical transparency entered the picture because in each ministry, we now have a team called participation officers. And their work is just like uh, media officer talk to journalists or the parliamentary officer talk to MPs. Their uh, job is to talk with those emerging hashtags. And just, uh, but how do you talk to a hashtag? There is no clear leader. So you must use the same hashtag and just intervene very quickly saying, oh, we would like to invite everybody who hashtag, um, you know, texting, uh, text filing to texting or something like that uh, to come to our text agency and co-design the text filing experience for the next year. And very magically, after sending out this invitation, of course, I just you know reply saying this is actually our um, participation officer and not some anonymous person. But in any case, um, actually, 80% of people start offering constructive criticism. Uh, they don't uh, just make personal attacks anymore because they understand it's now also their job. Instead of just complaining, they are now invited to the multi stakeholder workshop. And this radical transparency also in, uh, involves uh, publishing the whole um, background, the contextual information, so that we can gather people's ideas through Slido and live stream, so that this is the petitioner, by the way. He is a professional designer, so he cares the most and so suffers the most. Uh, and so he basically just uh, worked with everybody who inputs through Slido. And so we just turned those Slido comments into the post-it notes and using user journey, chronicled the entire text filing experience from the before and during and after text filing, and we just took every uh, single comment into account. There's many comments that are just repeated, and so we just use one single post-it note. For example, this one says that the words are explosively plenty, and it's uh, a very common instinct for us working in the public uh, service to harmonize this message, saying that it's maybe a little bit too verbose, or something like that, so that our boss don't you know, have a cardiac arrest, or something like that, right? They basically, we, we don't want to uh, make a very divisive or very strong message uh, to, to the public sector. But on the other hand, if we don't post it as is, well, taking away the exclamation marks, but if we don't post this as is, the citizens wouldn't feel that they're being invited as co-creators. They would feel that they're still the population, right? Uh, and so for the citizen to take an initiative, the government must show plenty of trust to the citizens by basically using their words as agenda and reading it exactly as said by the slide of questions. So if somebody said that the text file experience is so baroque, it's confusing, we must write it's so baroque, it's confusing. And that is the main thing that we have to do to show the trust uh, to the citizens. And then people after seeing that their words actually became the agenda, then would participate in our co-creation meetings. There's four of them where the people who are the most toxic online are invited to work with the people that they flamed. <laughs> Once they meet together face to face, there's 30% of trust. So it's very difficult uh, actually to keep attacking each other verbally. They have to sit down and start drawing new text on experience. And so because of radical transparency along each meeting, we can draw more people who have the passion to improve the text on experience and draw them into it without losing the previous context. So it's also very important as a recruitment tool. And so last year, uh, this new um, text filing experience gets piloted on Mac and Linux systems and this year we roll it out to everybody and with approval rating of 98%. And this is not uh, only because it's a good design, of course it's a good design, but also because thousands of people literally feel they have a stake in it. They contributed at least one visit note. And so through radical transparency they also want to share it with other constituents, their, their friends and family saying, oh I would like to volunteer um, you know, support you using this new text filing experience because I feel it's part of my work as well. And so we had a record number of volunteers who just work with their friends and family on this text filing experience and all 
thanks to the idea of radical transparency as adopted by the Ministry of Finance for the tax uh, division. And after that success story, and we printed as comic books and manga, um, in the National Palace Museum, the Ministry of Health and Welfare for the um, portable um, universal healthcare card case, and many other cases for digital service are now also embracing the same idea of open government collaboration meetings and radical transparency to involve people as co-designers of the service. Two people would like to know what is the most significant achievement under my portfolio of digital ministry, and the election is coming. Um, so aside from the you know more reactive counter disinformation thing, which is maybe ten percent of my work time, uh, we most actually uh, most of my work focus on the social innovation, and the social innovation, um, as I uh, explained, uh, involves this presidential promise called the presidential hackathon, and this is very significant because this is not directly output of my office. My work is just to design the mechanism so that people can all have their own innovations that work with the civil society and the academic to solve real social problems. And we're very happy to have our two champions here who have won twice, I think, in the past couple years. And so they were um, the one of the five champion teams the first year, which is last year, and also this year um, we're working on a, a different uh, topic that you will uh, soon hear from. So I'll just explain the structure a little bit. Every year we invite everybody from the civil society, from the social sector, from academia, uh, from the private sector as well as the public sector to start proposing ideas that can solve a real tangible public service issue. And the ideas um, may just be a very small thing. For example, last year, one of the teams started uh, with interviewing these repairs people of the Taiwan Water Corporation. <coughs> they, most of their work is just to listen to the pipes and find out they're not leaking. So it kind of kind of boring work. But uh, sometimes uh, they will listen to pipes that are leaking, and so their work become creative and they start solving the leaks. The Taiwan Water Corporation maintains one of the world's longest pipelines, and uh, many plastic pipelines as well. And so on average for the Jilong area, which is pretty close to here, it took two months between one new leak point for its detection by those touring repairs people. And so it's a very long time. And so also they were having troubles recruiting young people because this really is a kind of a not very psychologically rewarding work. And so they just made a wish, and they wish well. And the wish was, uh, how, what if we can uh, make a chatbot uh, on the line system, which like what's up, that every repairs people just wake up and their digital apprentice says, here are the three most likely leaking points for you to tour today. And each one maybe has 70% of uh, precision accuracy, so they would not squander a day. Every day they were bound to listen to one or two leaking points and uh, do it in a very creative fashion in their uh, job um, satisfaction. And so it's a good idea. They uh, work with machine learning experts as well as people in academia, and and they co-created a pilot for the Geelong area, and that really works. But they don't have the funding or the personnel to scale it out to the entirety of Taiwan. And this is where the presidential hackathon uh, enters play. Many hackathons are just for two days or three days. Presidential hackathon is three months. And during the three months, we coach each team to be tri-sectoral, uh, involving the data collaboratives from the government, non-government research, and industry. And so they can together co-develop the reliable data for the water flow, water pressure analysis, and so on, to make such machine learning solutions. So there's incentive for all the sectors to participate. And when they win, one of the five winning teams, the trophy is actually a projector. And if you turn on the projector, it projects the image of Dr. Tsai Ing-wen handing the trophy to you. And so this is very useful, especially for people in the public sector. Because if you're a director general, well, we have a director general here, <laughs> who, who is actually one of the champions. But if sometime your director general, who is not part of the team, uh, would sometimes say, oh, this is too expensive, I don't want to scale down, and so on, you just turn on the projector and project the president. And the director general would say, oh, there's budget, there's budget. Uh, before the end of the year, we still have some budget left. Um, and if your deputy minister or minister says, oh, this involves five different ministries, there's a lot of communication to do. Uh, I have more interesting issue on my hands. Maybe wait until next year. You just turn on the projector and your minister will say, oh, I'll have a call with the minister of health and welfare next week. Uh, because that uh, trophy is the presidential promise that we will do whatever it takes, personnel, budget, regulation, to make your idea that worth 
prototyped across sectors for three months into public policy within the next 12 months. And so that uh, we deliver on that five out of five for the previous year, so we get some street credibility. Uh, and so for this year, there's a record number, um, more than 100 uh, that entered into the presidential hackathon. And so um, many of them has a combination of assistive intelligence AI with collective intelligence CI. And um, all of them are required to choose one uh, sustainable development target as the banner of their web so that people internationally can also understand what are the solutions here to uh, plastic waste, to detect illicit financial flows, to measure for waterway pollutions and upload it to a distributed ledger, otherwise known as blockchain, um, to keep. keep uh, everybody honest and so on. And so all these are also mechanism designed because they involve all three sectors that uh, encourage people to share the data in a way that are more reliable and also internationally relevant. And so for example, the water saviors, which because they save water, you see, the water saviors were then invited by the New Zealand government who didn't used to have a water shortage problem, but because of climate change, they're starting to. Uh, and so instead of just buying an off the shelf uh, application, they co-create with the Taiwanese team for another three months after three months of presidential hackathon. And so we also delivered together uh, this kind of solutions for the Wellington Water Company as well. And so the whole idea here is just to make a infrastructure on which the social innovations can thrive and overcome the political uh, inertia, the silo effect that divides the different ministries and indeed different branches of the government apart. So that's the, the main idea. It, it's one of the most significant achievements, but it's not under my portfolio rather I support this using uh, my mechanism design um, skills and so on. So there's a question saying, do you encounter opposition from other government agencies for a project that I do in the digital ministry? So I introduced three working conditions. The two of them are location independence and radical transparency. So the third is voluntary association, meaning that I don't give orders and I don't take orders. So this is a, a very um, uh, Taoist way of, of working on public policy. I ask each ministry to send one person at most uh, to my office. So my office is a assemblage of all the different values because each ministry represents a value. Um, in Taiwan, we have 32 ministries, each with a very different value. Otherwise, they might as well merge. Uh, so these are the 32 vertical ministries, each with a vertical ministry. Uh, but in the executive yuan, which is the administration proper, there are nine horizontal ministers that take care of the value um, policing the values between uh, all those different ministries. And so for digital ministry, uh, what we are working on is instead of working with any particular ministry, we're asking if each particular ministry would like to send somebody to experience the idea of working out loud, of uh, radical transparency, of working with people. Now, I'll be honest and say, uh, we only had, um, I think, a dozen or so uh, ministries voluntarily sending people. There's people like Foreign Service that after watching for a year, finally decide to send somebody, send somebody here and for public diplomacy. Uh, and so we have delegate from many ministries. But there are also a number of ministries who never send anyone. For example, the Ministry of Defense never sent anyone. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> so, um, obviously, because radical transparency may not actually be their focus. <laughs> right, but most people facing um, ministries and agencies do send people. The Ministry of Culture, Communication, Education, Interior, um, uh, Finance, uh, Law, you name it, the, the usual suspects, the people facing ones. And so the idea here is that there is no opposition because I'm literally not giving them orders. They just brainstorm and say, oh, we'll have a touring social innovation tool. We'll have a petition platform. We'll have a participation officer arrangement. Let's do a presidential hackathon. And they have to lobby other ministries to make it happen together because they don't have the resource to make it happen by them own. And my main work is just to convince the president and the premier that these ideas from the career public service actually are worth a shot. And if it doesn't work, well, it's me to blame. Uh, and so I'm just absorbing the risk for all the delegates that's in my office. And so operating in this way, in a purely horizontal way, there's no way that I can face a position because I'm not really pushing anything, right? I'm just making sure that people can work together to work common values despite their initially different positions across different ministries. 
And so uh, I don't really have a digital ministry. This is a kind of virtualized ministry. Uh, the digital minister's office is just literally one person from each ministry working in purely horizontal way. Um, one person said, introducing new technology to create a culture known can be tough on the conservative and traditional politics. How would you communicate it to them? So I, I call myself a quote-unquote conservative and entirely non-hierarchical in nature. This is very easy to explain. But what about the conservative part? The conservative part means that I would like to conserve each and every culture that I work with. So this is the idea of the social innovation tours. Instead of asking people to come to Taipei to give a 40 minutes presentation, I visit their local habitat and learn from their culture, learn from their traditions, learn their languages. Our participation office in Manga actually have an indigenous Amis language version so that we communicate the idea of bringing technology to where people are instead of asking people to come to the sites of technology. And that, again, is our presidential champion's idea uh, last year. Uh, is just to, instead of flying through helicopters, uh, all the people who are sick from the offshore islands into the main Taiwan island, how about we use broadband connection to build a platform that the um, large hospitals doctors, the local nurses or clinic doctors, and the people who are in charge of operating the helicopter can work on the same virtualized platform to convince the people who are um, taking care of their their um, parents or their, their friends and families in the local clinic that they have the same access to have quality healthcare service without having to send that somebody through helicopter to Taiwan unless absolutely necessary. And so this idea of bringing technology to where people are in need uh, means that we conserve the local people's trust on their local clinics, on their local uh, social support and so on, instead of uh, you know flying people out and using digital technology to create arbitrary divisions between people who are good using phones and people who are not good uh, using their phones. We're basically saying it's good if you can ask slide of questions, but by all means ask, ask questions uh, through face-to-face -face conversation. So uh, the last question on Slido, and we still have some 15 minutes for face-to-face -face questions, um, is that could you say that uh, efforts uh, in the digitalization of Taiwan is causing the problem of populism? This is a great question. So when you uh, look at the term populism, uh, what really this is saying is two things. The first is that instead of just a bunch of elites making decisions for everyone, people would like everyone to make the decisions of everyone. This is the old idea of nothing about us without us. But it's also a dangerous thing if people call it a problem because it excludes uh, some part of the population and calling them essentially non-people. And so that is the danger of populism, is to create a, a pocket that you call your fellow people and exclude everybody else and call them non-people. And that actually is the danger of populism. So inclusive populism, for some maybe an oxymoron, <laughs> but it is actually the kind of work we're working on. Uh, it is just to include more people, to consider people that did not um, have a say in the um, politics. For example, people who are 15 or 16 years old, they don't have rights to vote. Um, when I started my first company, I was 15 years old, so I'm really <laughs> insistent on this. Um, I, I feel that I have a lot to contribute, but there's no way for me even to vote uh, for the district chief, right, for, for my vicinity. And so um, the entire idea of participatory budgeting, of petition platforms and so on, is that people who are 15 years old and who have a lot to say can have a way to enter into the policy making process. So it's inclusive populism in the sense that it makes people who are otherwise excluded by representative democracy into a active member. So many of our most active petitions are in fact raised by people who are 16 years old. Um, the two most active age group are 15 years old and 65 years old. I think that's because they have more time on their hands, but also because they care more about the next generation, uh, kind of by definition, because they haven't yet or has done already this kind of private uh, sector thing, and they are now working much more on the social sector. So around two years ago, there's a 16-year-old, uh, which we didn't know their real age at the time, actually, because the petition platform allows for pseudonyms, and we only know them by the pseudonym, I love elephants and elephants love me. So somebody with that pseudonym started a petition saying we should ban all the plastic straws and indeed all the plastic single-use utensils uh, from the restaurants and cafes. And uh, we just 
just know that it got 5,000 signatures in no time. So they're really good mobilizer. And the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, as well as our delegates to my office, um, imagine that it, this must be a very senior uh, leader in environmental activism to get such a good uh, report in such a short time. But when we meet them face to face in collaboration meetings, she's just 16 years old. And she said, this is my civics class assignment. My teacher just said, there's this new petition platform. Just find something that resonates with people. And, but she's really good at um, digital marketing and social media. So in no time, through hashtags, they get 5,000 petitions. And our work as public service is just to invite the people who actually produce those single-use um, utensils. It may be chop chopsticks, it may be straws, and so on. And they many of them in their 60s now, 65 years old now, uh, saying, I entered this business 30 years ago not because I want to make a quick profit, but rather I was a social entrepreneur because at that time, hepatitis B is a real problem in Taiwan. There's a lot of infections going on, and people rely on those single-use uh, chopsticks and other utensils to prevent the hepatitis B from spreading. But hep B is now fixed, right? Just take a pill, it's gone. And so because of that, they're also looking at alternative materials that are carbon neutral that doesn't damage the waterways and to renew their commitment to the social entrepreneurship. And then the young people started brainstorming with the elderly and they found maybe cafe wastes or the coffee wastes or the sugar cane wastes or literally reinforcing straws and things like that that are carbon neutral or even better and that can serve as new materials uh, to make uh, straws and or even redesign the cups so it doesn't require straw anymore uh, except for our national identity drink which is ice bubble tea which kind of requires a straw, but in any, in any case, um, they, they just work on the echo design for all the uh, appliances and utensils. And the great thing is that it builds intergenerational solidarity. The younger generation sets the direction. The older generation still produce the, the facilities and produce the straws, the utensils themselves, just led in a different direction set by the young people. And the 16-year-old petitioner, want a scholarship, uh, don't really have to go to strike on Fridays anymore. So that is our, our Greta. And, and, and we also had a really good conversation with many other 16 years old that uh, choose to raise the social consciousness on those petition platforms. And so my main point is that Populism may not be a problem if it is led by the people who are going to be impacted the most, uh, the, the young people, namely. Uh, and if the elderly can see them as very important agenda setters, reverse mentors, essentially, instead of people are uh, looking to cause the trouble, if we can design the mechanisms that they can reinforce each other's work, then the populism may not be a problem, it may be a solution. Uh, and so one additional question asks, does the presidential hackathon engage any international exchange with other units or events? Yes, we do. Um, so if we go to the presidential hackathon, which is PH Taiwan, all the, so this is kind of like a signature. Um, everything that we design um, ends in taiwan.gov.tw or net.gov.tw for national, and there's an international track. So um, you're now cordially invited for the next year's presidential hackathon. Uh, we will very much um, likely to repeat the same topic, which is enabling sustainable infrastructure. The idea is that Taiwan is one of the leading uh, jurisdictions to publish the entire procurement reports, not just the annual summaries, but the actual contracts that was uh, in the RFP process, as well as that finished the bid. And for all the WTO participating countries, it's very rare for a jurisdiction to publish all of it. Usually people just publish the absolute minimum as required by the WTO rules. But because we do believe in radical transparency, for all the research and academic purposes, you can get an entire um, transcript in the entire uh, data dump of the um, procurement process. And then the question is that we ask with our international partners, like the Open Contracting Partnership, what can you do when you have this kind of uh, standardized format of open contracting information. And so we asked everybody around the world to participate. And uh, last year, um, we did not have this OCP connection, but we already start building the international connections, such as sending people to New Zealand. And now we're saying, oh, people should come to Taiwan and solve our common issues on open contracting um, partnerships. And so the OCP worked uh, with many other organizations. And so we invited a, a lot of people. and. Uh, two teams that won, uh, very briefly, uh, are the Mintadek team uh, from Malaysia, 
uh, working on cart cartology. So basically, it's a study of cartels. Uh, by analyzing the open contracting, they can find people who often bid together, but uh, very consistently, one person, uh, one company wins, and every other company is just kind of uh, escorting uh, them for the win. Uh, and uh, just this kind of uh, cartel-like behaviors, they use machine learning algorithm to to detect potential cartels and potential collusions. And Honduras is also very innovative. They use the same open contracting data and cause sees the impact because they're one of the jurisdictions uh, with the most impact from the climate change, the, the most to lose. Uh, so they use the contract data to analyze the environmental impact even on the planning stage. So when you have a bid to plan some construction, they would then already project the environmental impact that's likely to cause and work with the environmental MPOs and the people around them to co-design an eco-friendly way because it can uh, actually contribute to eco-sustainability if you start designing early on enough, but if you design without ecosystemability in mind, in the later phases you can only minimize the damage. So the idea is to involve the eco designers as early as possible when the government is still just thinking about post potential builds. And all of this is of course powered by the open contracting partnerships, technologies and know-hows and standards, as well as Taiwan's uh, mentors and Taiwan's uh, people working to solve that problem, not only locally for Taiwan, but also internationally for our participating countries as well. So if you have some ideas of how to use procurement data or a indeed any other data to further uh, the building of uh, sustainable uh, infra infrastructures, feel free to start writing your proposal and you just might get invited to the presidential office and get a trophy from our president <laughs> um, uh, starting next year. And so that's the answer to the last question on Slido. And I promise that I will leave a question or two for the face-to-face -face crowd. So I will just um, you know ignore the Slido now uh, and then uh, focus on, on all of you and uh, whether you have something to uh, share, non-necessary questions around presidential hackathon or any of those creative mechanisms that we've been doing, please raise your hand. <laughs> but really no questions? We will have a session with Audrey after this. Um, so you can still uh, think about your questions and ask them later. But okay. Audrey, if we could invite you to sit, we still have a short program with you. Okay, of course. I hope this is not a surprise. Okay. Jeremy, can you join me on stage? So please? I'll sit where? Uh, here. Okay, that's great. Um, let's see this place. Okay. So again, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm Nini Salao. I'm with the Frederick Norman Foundation. I'm Jeremiah Tamas from the Liberal Party of the Philippines. You shared a lot of information about your work, and I'm sure our participants would, would like to know more about you as Audrey Dan. <laughs> <laughs> and as part of Radical Transparency, that's right, that's right, we will yes. publish this online as well. Of course, of course. The video, I'm sure, yes. So we will do fast talk. Yeah, okay. So we will ask short questions, and we would like you to answer them as quickly as short and as, as briefly okay. as possible. Okay. We can try with Jeremiah. What's your favorite color? Blue. Who's your favorite actor? Um, <laughs> I can't think of any. Did you rehearse? <laughs> um, My favorite okay. color is transparent. Right. Okay, Jeremiah will ask the first set of questions. So the first question is, what's your favorite movie? My favorite movie um, is Arrival. Uh, that talk about emojis. <laughs> What's your favorite book? Uh, my favorite book is Finnegan's Wake. It's a very rarely read book. What's your favorite? Who's your favorite superhero? Favorite superhero is everybody, actually, is everyday citizens, everybody who solve their problems on their own, scratch their own each. Uh, all the citizen innovators are my superheroes. Okay, so me, 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 it's my third class. Which do you like better, green tea or milk tea? <laughs> um, a mix. Milk, green tea. <laughs> with pearls, with boba, or without? Uh, all of them. <laughs> humans or robots? Humans or robots? Humans and robots. <laughs> humans and robots. Okay. Who do you like? Who do you prefer talking to? Alexa or Siri? Um, I'm, this is a bias, <laughs> honestly, because I've worked with Siri for six years. Um, of course, Siri, I haven't yet talked to Alexa. 
<laughs> Maybe Siri will make an introduction. Sometime. So, what do you use? Earphones or headphones? Both. What What song do you listen to most on Spotify? I don't really use Spotify. I use <laughs> Apple Music. <laughs> But, but, but uh, on, on Apple Music, um, I was just putting on repeat uh, the uh, song uh, Glory to Hong Kong. But then uh, that was a kind of pirate version, so they took it down, so I have to loop it on YouTube instead. <laughs> so what's your favorite series on Netflix, if you do watch Netflix? I do watch Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I, I don't really have a favorite, but I learned a lot from Black Mirror. And Black Mirror, uh, pre and after Netflix, provide a lot of kind of what not to do when doing maintenance and design. <laughs> okay, briefly, complete the sentence. Liberalism is? Uh, radical. <laughs> Innovation is? Liberating. Taiwan is? Taiwan can help. <laughs> All right, so um, where, where should I uh, just return there? And maybe uh, we switch to... Uh, we'll, we'll just uh, have uh, a oh, up. Oh, this one, yes. okay. Sure. We'll have, we have some tokens for you. So now, so now we'll be heading on to our second session, which will be facilitated by uh, Sir Jason Gonzalez from uh, the Philippines as well. Uh, he's the Director General of the Liberal Party of the Philippines.